church in Lubbock, Texas. I am Pastor Solomon Fields, and I want you to know that God has a word for you this day. I believe God is able to bless you right where you are, in the home, in the car, or wherever you may be. I want to begin by reminding us of what the Apostle Peter wrote. 2 Peter chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned. Since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Amen. God bless you. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Lord, our Savior, our Redeemer, thank you for another privilege. Thank you for another day. Your blessings are so numerous that even if we could count them all, we would not have enough tongues to say thank you. Lord, I thank you for another opportunity to stand now and just intercede on behalf of your people. Somebody is hurting. Somebody's heart is broken. Somebody's body has been inflicted with injury and pain and disease. I know that you are a doctor that's never lost a case. I know that you can speak a word. I know you can speak peace in the midst of chaos and confusion. Have your way, Lord Jesus. Move in the lives of those that are listening so that when they come through the storms of their lives, when they come through to the other side, Lord, they will say like the children of Israel, if it had not been for the Lord on our side. Thank you, Lord, for your delivering power. Thank you for your strength, Lord. Thank you for your saving grace. We ask now that you would speak this night through song proclamation of the word that your people Lord will be better that your people will be strengthened that your people will be returned re 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 recruited back into the army of the Lord that your people Lord will go forth and share the good news help us this night help us Lord Jesus asking in your name we believe it by faith. Amen. We're going to ask Brother Michael Connor if he would come now and give us songs of praise. And as he sings songs of praise, you just praise the Lord right where you are. This is your opportunity to sing right along with him. Amen. May the Lord bless you.
that's something you should give God praise for. If he brought you out of trouble, that's something to give God praise for. All you have to do is just lift your hands and say, Lord, you are good. And your mercies endure forever. Come on now, you can help me sing it.
things that he's done for us. And you ought to just lift your hands and just praise him.
can't figure it out because all that I do and all that I give, my worship, my worship is for real. And I just stand here and say, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
do not grow, they close their doors and perhaps even go bankrupt. In our personal lives, we should expect to grow. We grew from a child to an adult, from an adult to a mature adult. We, we get jobs, we have finances, and we hope those finances increase. We have relationships, and we expect the relationship to grow. We are expected to grow. Paul said, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I even thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. 
we expect to grow. And so the writer here, Peter, is alerting us to what we should already know, but he's also encouraging us to grow. And he's not talking about corporate growth of the body of Christ. He's talking about as individuals, each one of us that is listening is expected to grow. In the text here, Peter reminds them of what they knew in advance. In verse number two of chapter three, he, worked, he wrote about words spoken by the holy prophets and the apostles. The people had heard those words. In verse two, he talked about last days, scoffers, mockers of the faith, those that were living and promoting fleshly lusts. In the last days, there would be false teachers that would proclaim a perverted gospel. A gospel that denies the power and the grace of God. A gospel that rejects the redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ. A gospel that excludes the cross and the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. A gospel that ignores the day of the Lord. It was a perverted gospel and Peter is saying you already know that's what they're going to tell since we know that the devil is always busy, since we know that the devil does not take days off, since we know that he has planted false teachers and preachers in the body of Christ, in the church, I believe the Apostle Peter is telling us several things from this text. The first thing he tells us is simply be on God your guard up. Peter writes, since you've been warned about what's coming, since you already know that the enemy has schemes and tactics in these last days, since you know that he's still in the business of kill, steal, and destroy, since you know he's like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, Peter's simply telling us, be on guard. Some years ago, I watched a boxing match. One of the things that I noticed, and I noticed, I noticed that the boxer did his best to keep his hands up. The purpose of keeping the hands up was to keep his guard up. If the boxer let his hands down, if, if he tried to parade and dance like he was Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Leonard or someone like that, he was subject to be knocked out, lose the fight, and possibly carried out of the ring. It's important to keep your guard up. We know the Bible teaches us. We know the Bible teaches us that the Lord is faithful. He will establish you. He will guard you from every evil one. That's 2 Thessalonians 3 and 3. We know what you wrote in verse 24. Now unto him who's able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. We know these scriptural promises, but these scriptural promises are not excuses for not being on guard. Too many people are victims of false teachers. Too many people are victims of a heresy gospel, a peddling gospel, a perverted gospel because they are simply not on guard. The danger of not being on guard, you fall away from your steadfastness. That's what Peter says here in the text. You, you, you fall away. I see a couple of warnings here. And for those of us who are believers, and I believe that Peter is writing to believers, the danger here is being pulled away from sure footing and foundation. So I think a couple of things. First of all, I believe he's saying, be careful being overconfident. Overconfidence will cause a person to let their guard down. When you start thinking, I've been a Christian for so long, I never
never do that. You start bragging about your historical record instead of the strength and the might of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. When you think you are all so strong, when you think you are all of that and a happy meal, Paul says be careful. That's when you fall. Romans chapter 12 verse 3 he said not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And I believe our writer Peter here is telling us be careful with being overconfident because you can be pulled away. Peter can testify to the fact that overconfidence is dangerous. You remember Bible readers that how he bragged about how he would go to prison and even die for the Lord Jesus Christ. Then a few hours later, he denied him three times. I believe Peter has a right to tell us, you need to be on guard. But secondly, not only the overconfidence can cause us to drift away. I believe there's another warning here that being led away with the error of the wicked that there are wicked people that are designed by Satan to pull us from our firm foundation the word fall away here is the same word used to describe the behavior of the Jews and Barnabas in Galatians 2 and 13 some of you may remember that 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 they were eating with the Gentiles and when the Jews from Jerusalem came they separated themselves and tried to pretend like they had not been with those Gentiles in other words they don't mind associating with people outside of their race and their nationality when they're friends and acquaintances are not around but when their friends show up they try to act like they don't even know I believe Peter's saying here that sometimes friendship and peer pressure and even business relationships can pull us away from a steadfast foundation. I know that good old preaching and teaching that's designed to trick and manipulate us can pull us away. I'm talking about the kind that can scratch your ear and you can say, yes, he really got it on, but didn't tell you anything. I believe even in those situations, they can pull us away from a sure foundation. So I believe what Peter is saying to us as church, we've got to be on guard. At some point, you ought to throw in the gravy and say, bring on the meat. Well, look at what Peter has warned us. He's warned us about scoffers. He's warned us about people mocking. But look what he says in verse 18. Because in verse 18, he tells us how to keep from falling away. How to keep from being led astray. How to keep from being snickered and pulled from our sure foundation. I believe he simply is telling us, grow. Look what he said in verse 18. But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But grow. Literally, this means constantly growing. It is not growing in a spurt and then stopping. But it is continuous growing day in and day out. Christians can persevere to the end and receive the eternal reward when they grow. The way to remain vigilant in this life, the way to endure to the end is to grow. I believe if we grow, our faith grows as it becomes more ample and conquering. Our love grows as it becomes more fervent and diffusive. Our hope grows as it becomes calm and bright. Our self-abasement, our humility grows. Our, the power of the work that we do will grow. Concentrating on the things of the truth will grow. And yes, even the strength to bear hardship and injury will will grow. At some point in your life you ought to be able to just knock it off your shoulder 
Instead of getting mad every time somebody does something to you. There are areas in our life that I believe if we grow in grace, God will get the glory. Let's look at two areas of growth here in the text. Right here in verse 18, Peter says, grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at grow in grace first. But if you notice when you read the book of Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2, it says grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and the Jesus our Lord. Grace multiplied. That means you don't have all the grace when you gave your life to Christ. Grace is so big that you can jump in grace and never hit the bottom. Grace is the foundation of the life of the believer and it is the gift of God. It is not a static reality. It is a constant growing and expanding reality. In fact, the more you jump into grace and eat of grace and grow in grace, the more grace there is. So believers are encouraged to grow in grace, nurture in that grace, and be strengthened in the grace of God. Let me show it to you in the scripture. In 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5 and 7, he says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness is love. In other words, it's a constant growing. The more you learn about Jesus Christ, the more you digest and understand the grace of God, it is a constant learning, but it's a never-ending learning. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, may the God of all grace, that, that means there's not just a little bit of grace, there's not just one peculiar aspect of grace, it's a, he's the God of all grace. So there's more grace to learn each day of our life. Peter says in verse 5 and 10, may the God of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. Church, we are encouraged to constantly be growing in grace. I think that there's grace for every situation, for every circumstance that we will encounter in this life. Whether you're up, there's grace for that. Whether you're down, there's grace for that. Whether you're healthy, there's grace for that. Whether you're sick, there's grace for that. Whether you're poor or whether you are wealthy, there's grace. I believe just like his mercies are new every morning. I believe he's got grace for every day, for every hour, for every minute, and every second of our lives. And I believe we ought to grow in grace. And I think when we grow in grace and we understand that in every situation, in every encounter that we have, that grace is involved, then we can jump on the bandwagon and say, it was amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I believe the Apostle Paul wrote to us in 1 Corinthians 15 and 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And you know that Paul said at the foot of Gamaliel, you know that Paul was an educated man. You know Paul was a Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin. You know that Paul was this and that. But Paul says it is by the grace of God. I am what I am. Let's look at not only growing in grace, let's look at growing in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When we read the Bible, 
we learn something very quickly that Jesus Christ is the central theme of the whole Bible. So the more you read the Bible, the more you study the Bible, the more that you memorize the Bible, and the more that you meditate on the Bible, you are learning more about him. There are people who hang around the church but never grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about putting a Bible across your forehead and going to sleep. No, it doesn't work by osmosis. I'm talking about putting your head in the Bible and focusing on the word and absorbing them into your life and adhering to the word of God. Just hanging around the church and packing a Bible will not help you to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Do I need to remind us that Judas, one of the 12 disciples, he hung around Jesus but never grew to have an intimate knowledge of Jesus as Lord and Savior. Make sure you're not just hanging around the church trying to talk about how long you've been in the church. Peter is simply telling us, grow. Make sure you have a personal, intimate knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need to grow in knowing him. See, when you grow in knowing him, then after a while you'll be able to say, like mama and them used to say, the things I used to do, I don't do anymore. The places I used to go, I don't go anymore because I can see clearer now because I'm walking in the light of Jesus Christ. We need to grow in knowing Jesus Christ. Grow so much till you get like Job. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And I know some of us value life very much, but Job got to the place where, you know what, if whatever happens in this life, I'm still going to put my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Job says, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at the last on the earth. That's an intimate knowledge of knowing the Lord. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy 1 and 12, I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. What have I committed unto him? I have committed my life to Jesus Christ. And Paul is saying, come what may. Now I don't care how many times they beat me. I don't care how many times they stole me. I don't care how many times I'm shipwrecked. I don't care about any of that. I am putting my trust in him because I know him. In fact, Paul would go on to say, I can do all things through Christ. That strengthens me. That's knowing him. Make, make sure you know him. And when you really know him, to know him is to have an intimate knowledge. And it grows us in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Listen, somebody needs to hear me. Hear me. The knowledge of the Bible is good, but knowledge of him who the Bible is about is much better. To know him so intimate that you can say he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me that I am his own. That's an intimate see type relationship and I believe when we learn of Jesus Christ then we grow look at this letter here Peter concludes with the purpose of growth we ought to be on God and yes we ought to grow but he gives us the purpose of growth in the conclusion of this letter he says to him be the glory both now and forever amen so I submit to us that when you grow you grow for the glory of God not for self glory not for self adoration not for self applause not for that applause, but you grow for the glory of God let me share the difference. We understand diets, and diets, some diets are balanced, and some diets are what I call unbalanced. Can we look at Peter, the writer of our text again? Peter, I believe, would give us a good illustration. A spiritual imbalanced diet 
will result in one day saying, Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. And then after hearing Jesus talk about going to Jerusalem and suffering and three days, died three days in the grave, Peter's trying to rebu rebuke the Lord. That's an imbalanced diet. An imbalanced diet is one day refusing to let Jesus wash your feet. And then the next minute talking, Lord, not only my feet, but every part of me. That's an imbalanced diet. An imbalanced diet is one day claiming to defend the Lord. Lord, I'm with you. I'm loyal to you. I'm dedicated to you. I'll go to prison. I'll even die if necessary. And then a few hours later, saying, I never knew the man. That's an imbalanced spiritual diet. Maybe we ought to look closer at us. An imbalanced spiritual diet is one day I can believe that the Lord is able to do exceedingly abundantly more than we ask or think. And then we hear something on the news or hear something from the doctor and we declare the Lord has forgotten us. That's an imbalanced diet. But you know what a balanced diet is? Let's look at Peter one more time. A balanced diet that has the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ is like Peter on that day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when he was filled with the Holy Ghost and he began to proclaim the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He told the people the good news of the saving grace of Jesus and 3,000 souls were saved. That's from a balanced diet. I believe Peter was fulfilling his position as the little Petra, the little rock. Jesus said, upon this rock I build my church. And he was talking to the little rock Peter that Peter would be a pivotal part of building the early church. And I believe he's doing that now that he's grown in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Spiritual balanced diet will get you to the place where you can simply say whatever I am is to the glory of God. You get to the place when you have a balanced spiritual diet that you can look at your spiritual gifts and talents and abilities and you can say whatever I have is to the glory of God of God. When you look at whatever position you're standing in, whatever status you have gained, be it economic or whatever it may be, you will simply say, to the glory of God. Whatever success, whatever gifts, whatever abilities, whatever you have, you say, it's because of him and not because of me. Peter here in our text Concludes with this, what some theologians call a doxology. And normally, doxologies direct us toward God and they focus on God as in God the Father. But Peter here in our text focuses on Jesus, the Son of God. He says, now and forever, and then he says, amen. In other words, Peter is saying, today and tomorrow. And I don't know if this is true or not, but maybe, maybe, just maybe, Peter is remembering what John wrote in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was was God. Maybe he's trying to tell us here in the conclusion in this doxology that Jesus is God. Maybe he remembers that the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Maybe he's telling us Jesus is God. I don't know but I kind of like what John wrote in 1 John 3 and 2, beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it do not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. In other words, we will be like God. So when you grow, you throw glory to God. Why should you grow? Simply for the glory of God. That's 
That's why the psalmist would write the song, to God be the glory for the great things that he has done. And I know some of us are going through hard times. Some of us are thinking we're coming out of this. Some of us are parading around like there never has been a coronavirus. But guess what? Through it all, you ought to simply say, to God be the glory. I know people have lost their lives. I know people are hanging on by the thread. I know people have lost their jobs. I know people are hurting and people are in pain. But to God be the glory. If you grow, God gets the glory. And somehow through your growth, God is able to help others that are struggling in this life. And so it becomes a ripple effect by your growth. God gets the glory, somebody else is blessed, and somebody else starts to grow, and then the process continues over and over and over again. We have an example of growth. Jesus said something except a seed fall in the ground and dies. You do know that when it dies, it comes back up through growth. And oh, I'm so glad that Jesus went to a place called Calvary and he died on the cross and they placed him in a grave. But early Sunday morning, he rose from the grave like the first fruit of our redemption. In other words, he died so that we may live, so that we can grow. And when you die to yourself and give yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ, that's when growth really happens. Peter's saying, regardless of what's going on around you, Regardless of the heartaches, regardless of the situation, circumstances, no matter what they may be, it may be trouble, trauma, and tragedy, all wrapped up in one package. I believe Peter is saying to us, just like he said to them back then, grow. Let's pray. Father, Many times we have excuses for not obeying your word. Many times we want to blame the situation. We want to blame somebody for not having, for not knowing. But oh God, help us grasp your word this night. It is often doing the trials and the tests of our lives that we grow the best. It is often doing the storms of our life that we grow closer and more intimate with you as Lord and Savior. So Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, do to us whatever you need to so that you can do through us anything that brings you glory. I thank you this night. I thank you, Lord, for the hero. Bless us in a special way. Not only this day, but every day of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've been listening, and maybe you've been wondering why your growth is stunted, I recommend it could be that you drop your guard. I recommend that it could be that you're not growing in the grace of what the Lord Jesus has done for you. His life, his ministry, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his precious presence.
promises. Grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of Him. Even right now, wherever you are, ask the Lord. Ask like David, Lord, teach me. Teach me, Lord, your laws. Teach me your ordinances. Teach me your statutes. So that I may apply them to my life. When I apply them, I grow. Help us, Lord Jesus. If you don't know him in a personal, intimate way, you cannot grow without salvation. Without accepting him in your heart. I'm not talking about church membership. I'm talking about being a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. A child of God. If you don't know him as your Lord and Savior, that's first before you can ever grow. And if you know him as Lord and Savior, feast on his word. Brother Connors is going to come and give us a song of invitation. We'd love to hear from you. Visit our website. Go to the prayer request tab. If you made a decision for Jesus Christ, let us know. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. God does not want you to forever be a babe in Christ. He wants you to grow. We'd love to hear from you.
say this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our lives. This morning we thank you for joining us once again. We thank you for being with us and we pray that there has been some word, some song, something today that has touched your heart. Because it is our desire that God meet every need that you have on today. For our subject today was says grow. He don't want us to stay stagnant. He don't want us to stay still. He wants us to continue to move, move forward and deeper and higher in his word. For St. John chapter 15 verse 2 says, We must bear fruit. Every branch of me that bears not fruit, he take it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth much fruit. We praise the Lord for the word this morning that has come from our pastor helping us to be everything that God has us to be. Perhaps there's some urgent prayer that you have in your life that you need someone to stand with you with. Someone to aim to go to God on your behalf. Someone to just be standing the gap for you. Someone just to stand with you. We want you to know that we are here today. Our hearts, our minds are open to help you. We realize that so many are saying they can't sleep these days and they're waking up and their mind is going and their mind in chaos. But we realize that God says, I will give you peace that surpasses all understanding. Call us today on that number that's going across our screen. Call us and leave your name and your number and your most urgent prayer request and we will help you and be with you. Perhaps you have given your life to the Lord today. Realize that we're not just here just doing this, but we want to help others come in unto the fold what we know. So call us that we may put some more literature in your hand and we can sit down and talk with you and let you know that God loves you. He is a healer, he is a saver, and he is a deliverer. I'd like to listen to these messages again. We ask you to call us and we can put the CDs and live DVDs into your hands. If you would like to write us, the number and our address is also on our screen. We're asking you on today that if you would like to donate to this ministry, we would be so appreciative of you on today. You can go to our website at sjbc.com. LBK. Just follow the link and we will lead you into donations or giving. Because we know that God will bless those who bless his house. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to do. We hope you have joined us and enjoyed the service today. For we have given our all in all unto God. The worship has come forth. The message has come forth. And now we ask you, what will you do with God's word on today? Follow us on Wednesday. Meet us here again at 7 p.m. for Bible study. We will be back. Just want to encourage your heart and keep you lifted up in such a time as this. And we just thank you for praying for St. John. And we want you to know that we are praying for you. We'd like to say hello to the St. John family. And also thank you to those who have joined us this morning. We hope that your week be more kind and that you are more settled and know that God will never leave me nor forsake me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.